For fans of American gas-powered cars, I have some bad news. The future of personal transportation is electric and it's Chinese. Within 20 years, Ford and GM and probably Stellantis, the parent company of Chrysler, will be as important to cars as IBM is to computers. A part of history, but not where people go if they want to buy the products of that day. And there's very little they can do about it, and they're not even doing that. In a recent video, I showed this chart and talked briefly about how what Ford and GM were doing on electric cars was irrelevant since they weren't significant players in the EV market. I want to dig a bit deeper into that story and how it connects to two of my favorite business books, The Innovator's Dilemma and Crossing the Chasm. In The Innovator's Dilemma, Clayton Christensen explains with lots of examples that when there's a technological revolution, the leaders in the previous generation are rarely the leaders in the following one. The incentives are to keep making money as long as possible in the current environment and not change the marketplace. This makes it nearly impossible for companies to make the move during a technology revolution. Microsoft and Apple's approach to smartphones are a great example of this dilemma and, two, and the two companies' very different approaches. Microsoft was concerned that phones would eat into desktop and laptop sales, so they didn't release a good phone OS until it was too late. That's what normally happens. Apple explicitly said that the iPhone would eat into their iPod profits, which was their cash cow at that time. And that was okay. We can also look at online retail for another great example. The top five online retailers are Amazon, eBay, Kroger, Apple, and Etsy. Only one of these was a significant player in the bricks and mortar world, and only two of them even existed in that space. Safeway, Costco, Walmart all still exist, and they have an online presence, but they aren't leaders, they're followers. Electric cars are the same. Legacy companies dip their toes in the field, but they make way more money selling internal combustion engine, or ICE, cars, so they keep doing that and play in the EV world when required to by regulations, mainly from California or Europe. The worst is probably GM. They had the best electric car in the world with the EV1, but when California weakened their zero emission requirement after the auto manufacturers won a lawsuit, GM didn't just stop making the EV1, but in 2003, they gathered them all up and crushed them. This was the subject of the documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? Maybe the title should have been, Who Delayed the Mainstream Adoption of the Electric Car? But that isn't as catchy. Later, California required that a percentage of each company's passenger vehicles be zero emission. Other states in the West and Northeast also adopted this requirement. Most companies have done the bare minimum, and some not even that. Instead, they buy allowances from companies that sell more EVs than required. Then along came Tesla, which had no investment in or expertise in building ICE cars. They only sold EVs, and part of their revenue was selling allowances to the legacy players. Tesla developed experience designing and building EVs, while the legacy players were fat and stupid making lots of money selling gas-guzzling SUVs. We in the U.S. know all about Tesla. What is less known is what's going on in China. Here's a chart of the best-selling EVs worldwide from July to August of 2023. The number one producers of EVs isn't Tesla, it's BYD, a Chinese company. The highest-selling car from a company not named Tesla or BYD was the Chinese company GAC's Aeon S. The top 10 selling EVs are either Chinese or Tesla. The best EV from a legacy manufacturer was the VW ID4, which came in at 11th. The second highest was the VW ID3 at 17th. And some of these EVs are seriously cheap, selling for less than $10,000. These low-end ones aren't Tesla fast with enormous ranges, but they do meet most people's needs most of the time. This is classic innovator's dilemma. The sporadic engagement by the legacy companies, new companies selling niche alternative products that have some advantages to the legacy products, but generally don't look as good unless you focus at what they're good at and can live with what they're bad at. In this case, range and fueling time. 
The niche products get better and better, and eventually people wonder why they ever bought the legacy product. Just look at range anxiety. The first EVs had a range of less than 100 miles, and there was almost no charging network. You could do your daily commute, come home, and plug it in, and that was about it. Now a typical new, new EV has a range of about 300 miles. The number of charging stations has increased by a factor of 10 over the last 10 years and continues to grow. So you don't need to charge as often and there are a lot more places to do it. Pretty soon running out of charge will be like running out of gas. It can happen, but it's because you did something wrong. China is now the world's largest car market by a sizable margin and EVs have about a 30% market share there. This was not an accident, but the results of an active government putting policies in place that supported this nascent industry. They have the advantage of having no significant legacy car industry that needs protecting. As Chinese companies try and sell cars in Europe and North America, there are accusations of dumping and other government supports that aren't allowed under the World Trade Organization. And these accusations might be right, but irrelevant. The Chinese companies are building their expertise faster than their counterparts in the West. And eventually, the government support will be removed and they'll know how to build cars that can compete without unfair subsidies. At that point, the legacy players will be asking for trade barriers to protect them from Chinese cars that are better and cheaper than the ones they make. Having followed the EV market for about 15 years, I can't help but think of Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm. In it, he talks about five stages of product adoption with a huge gap or chasm during the second stage. The innovators were the people who took an old Honda Civic in 1987 and converted it to an EV at home, or who bought the first generation of EVs like the EV1. Next come the early adopters like myself who owned a second generation Nissan Leaf. These are production cars that fill the niche but not fully replace an ICE car. For us, we had two cars, off street parking, and lived in a major city where it was rare for either car to go as much as 40 miles in a day. So having one of them be an EV was easy. But crossing the chasm from early adopters to early majority is hard and hasn't happened in the US yet. But it has happened in China and Europe where the market share for new cars is almost 30 and 20% EVs respectively. If EVs follow the normal course of technological advancement, and they have so far, then it's pretty clear what's going to happen. Every year, EVs will get a little better, charging networks will get better, and prices will drop. This will increase sales and improve the economies of scale. So investment will lead to better EVs, a virtuous cycle. Within 20 years, a car with an internal combustion engine will be like a car today with a carburetor something for a collector. And most of the EVs will be made by companies in China that before today, you've probably never heard of. Tesla will prosper. Ford and GM and Stellantis will still exist, but they will have to pivot because no one will want the cars they're able to make. And they can't compete with the companies that have been focusing on EVs since 2020. Of the legacy players, VW sells by far the most EVs so if they stick with it, they might survive the transition. Hyundai, Stellantis, and BMW also cracked the top 10, so there's some hope. But it will be difficult because the supply chain is centered in China. But Ford and GM are going to have about 10 years of profits, then realize they can't compete with EVs. They'll probably try and buy a Chinese company and realize they can't afford them. Some might say that Ford has been around since 1903 and cars are much different today than then. But really, not so much. Even the Model T worked pretty much the same as a modern car. A mechanic from 1930 wouldn't be able to fix a modern car with all of its electronic components, but he could probably go through the engine compartment and tell you the name of every system. Cars have evolved over the last century, but they, there hasn't been any revolutions. 
Ford understands how to make very complicated components like transmission, fuel injectors, and engine blocks. But none of these are part of an EV. What it doesn't know how to do is make batteries the most critical component of an EV. I just talked about light vehicles, but this all applies to trucks, both small and large. Tesla has the fugly Cybertruck, Rivian the R1T, Tesla even has the Semi. Pretty soon, every parking spot at a truck stop will have a big plug. For those who miss the sound of a car without a muffler, my only advice is to watch old movies. I won't miss that at all. My advice to Ford and GM is to jump in now with both feet or plan for a pivot in 20 years. For investors, I wouldn't go long on any of the legacy players, but I don't trust the Chinese stock market where transparency is lacking, so I wouldn't invest there either. So I have no good advice for anyone. If you have some advice, please share them in the comments, especially if you think I'm wrong. If you found this insightful, please like and subscribe and share with anyone you know who think EVs are just a fad.